It's not very often I have to raise a mic stand. I'm just that short. Okay, here we go. All right. Sometimes technology can be our best friend, can't it? You know what? Uh, this week, uh, I'm going to say technology has not been my friend. Um, here, several weeks back, I sent out a, an email. It was a rather important one. Uh, it had some articles in there for a gentleman, and it was one of those where it was a deadline. I mean, he had to have them, and so I worked hard, and I got them done, and I sent them in. And uh, probably a week after that or so, something like that, Judy, I went through my emails, and I just started deleting everything I didn't need because it was just getting cluttered. So everything went. I mean, just whatever I didn't need went, and that one went because everything was good. Uh, I did all of those on my laptop, and I saved them to my laptop. Uh, all of a sudden, my laptop, my laptop didn't work. Are you all familiar with the black screen of death? Okay, I thought I had that going on. Okay, I'm not sure I still don't. Uh, but needless, I could not get to those files. And so the gentleman sent me an email and said, Hey, I haven't received them, and my inward parts groaned. I said, dude, I sent them a few weeks ago. Well, I don't have them. Can you resend them? No, I can't. Because here's what happened. And so I told him that, and he went, oh. So all day Thursday, I was rewriting articles. And, and that was OK. Uh, but technology was not my friend. Uh, microphones down here, it's a simple matter of hitting a few buttons for them to make the connection. Okay? Um, <laughs> That's what the problem is with it after I looked at it. We're not going to worry about it this morning. Okay? Jesus did not have a microphone on the Sermon on the Mount. So I think we're okay. All right? I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke chapter 2. Uh, Luke chapter 2, I was visiting uh, in a nursing home this, uh, this last week. And I was asking some of, the, some of the people that were there about their bucket list. You know, we all have those, right? Uh, what's, a, what's the definition of a bucket list? Things we want to do before we? Well, I was going to say kick the bucket, but yeah. Okay. And so I was, I was asking them. I said, I just, I'm just kind of curious. What's, what's on your bucket list? I had a few that said they wanted to go back to where they were, uh, where they were raised as children. Many of them said our, our houses aren't even there anymore, but it's home. And I would just love to go back there. Scott, I had a few that said, I'd love to jump out of an airplane. I gave him your phone number. I thought that'd be pretty cool, okay? You know, there were some that said, well, I, you know, on my bucket list, I've always wanted to travel and I've always wanted to go and do things like that. Uh, we all have those things, right, that we would just love to do. And, and things that before we die, it's kind of that goal uh, that we have. Uh, here in Luke chapter 2, we read about a bucket list of sorts, okay? Um, as we set the scene in Luke chapter 2, it's the account of the birth of Jesus. I want us to start in uh, verses uh, 21 uh, through 24, and we're going to kind of build up to this bucket list. It says, at the end of eight days, when he, Jesus, uh, when he was born, he was circumcised. The name given by the angel uh, before him was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And so as we set the scene for what this bucket list is going to look like, uh, I want us first of all to look at this, that at the birth of Christ, there were three different aspects of the Old Testament law that are intertwined in these verses. Some people say the Old Testament is the Old Testament, the New Testament is the New Testament, and never the twain shall meet. Uh, can I say this? Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all relevant, and it all goes together. Okay? It just does. That's why we preach 
the Old Testament, why we preach the New Testament. But there were three different aspects just in these few verses. In Luke chapter 2, verse 21, it says, All male children were to be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. This would have taken place in Bethlehem, and we see reference to that in Genesis chapter 17. In verse 22, waiting 40 days after the birth of a son, mothers were to present themselves in the temple for their purification. This is mentioned in Leviticus chapter 12. And then in verses 23 and 24, it says that the law required that a mother and father present their firstborn son before the Lord to be redeemed by the offering of a sacrifice. And we see this in the book of Exodus, chapter 13. I want you to notice this, that throughout the entire Christmas account, okay, God left nothing to chance. Okay? They followed the law as they knew it, right? And this goes all the way back into the Old Testament. So Joseph and Mary not only obeyed the angel when they named their boy Jesus, but they also obeyed God. Luke mentions five times about the importance of and how they kept God's law. And I think there's, a, there's an interesting principle here that is kind of an aside to all of this. But I think it's a great challenge for us as parents. I think it's a great challenge for us as grandparents. We need to make sure that we are doing what God wants to do for our families. Okay? Uh, I don't think we can discount the word of God and what God is telling us as we are raising our children. As we are being an influence on our grandchildren, on our great-grandchildren. Beth, how many greats do we have? Great, great? Another great. Okay. Wherever we find ourselves. I think it's an important principle that we see there. We want to make sure that we are doing what God wants for our family. This verse here, this series of verses, also gives us a look at the financial situation of Joseph and Mary. Remember this. Uh, were Mary and Joseph rich? They were not. Okay. Uh, they, they were not what you would call economically stable, okay? How do we know that? You look at what the sacrifice was, and, and the law said that if, if you were poor, you could give this, this sacrifice, and that is exactly what Mary did. She could not afford a lamb, so they brought two doves or two pigeons instead. You see, God made provision for the poor, to follow his law. His law wasn't just for the rich and the wealthy. It was for everyone. So at this point, where we see all of these things, here comes Simeon. Uh, he enters into the story. Uh, outside of Luke chapter 2, we don't really know much about Simeon. There, there isn't anything else that is mentioned. We don't know his background. We don't know his education. We don't know his hometown. We're not even sure of his occupation. Okay? We assume that he was a priest. The text doesn't come right out and say that. We also believe that he was an old man, but we're not for sure there either. Uh, he simply appears, and he has a part in this narrative, but then he is gone. He's never seen and he's never heard from again, okay? What does that say to us? You know what, all of us have a story to tell. You might not think you're the most important person to ever walk the face of this earth, and you know what, I'm not. I will say that, but here's what I will say. God can use the ordinary to bring about the extraordinary, and that is what has happened with Simeon. We just don't know anything else about him. Luke begins the story here in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon's name means this, he who hears. Here's what we know about Simeon. We know that he was righteous and he was devout in his relationship with God. Okay? One commentary put it this way, uh, he was not phony like the Pharisees. Okay? Uh, Simeon was uh, what we would call the real deal. Okay? Simeon was authentic, he was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the Messiah to come. That's what waiting for the consolation of Israel means. Luke uses a Greek word of anticipation in verse 25. It means this. Uh, he wasn't just passively waiting, but he was anxiously awaiting the appearance of the Messiah. And he was also ready to welcome him. You see, it's one thing, it is one thing to be alert and to be looking for his appearance, okay? To me, it's quite another thing to be ready to welcome him. And here we have Simeon. He was ready, and he was waiting, and he was excited. Why? Because he knew who Jesus was, the Messiah, the one that was to come. We know this also about Simeon. Uh, he was a spirit-filled and a spirit-led man. I can just picture it. Early every morning, Simeon probably went to the temple watching and waiting for Emmanuel, God with us, to come, to appear. We don't know how long this had happened. We don't know if it was days, if it was years, if it was decades. We don't know the reaction of the people that were around him. Why do I say that? Do you all remember Noah? Okay. So Noah is building the ark. Okay. Did Noah have did Noah have the appreciation of the people that were around him. Okay, so what was their reaction? Let them know where you go. Okay. This was the world around Noah, right? Okay. Within the church, very often those same mindsets can apply. Oh, here comes Simeon. He's, he's watching and waiting. He did it yesterday. Nothing happened. He did it the day before. Nothing <laughs> happened. Wasn't he here last month? Yeah. We don't know how long this went on. But we do know that he was waiting anxiously. <coughs> how would he know him? What should he look for? Every time a young couple comes in with a baby, did he whisper, man, I wonder if this is him? We don't know. But suddenly, Simeon's heart leaps within him. The long days of waiting are over. It says here in verse 28, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and he said something. You know what I love about Simeon? Simeon doesn't even stop to introduce himself. Does that seem rude? He didn't even do that, did he? He didn't say, hey, I'm Simeon. I want to hold your baby. We don't know. He simply took Jesus and he held him. As Mary gives her infant to Simeon, I can't help but think that he was thinking something like this, I am holding the salvation of the world in my arms. I am holding him right here. And it is at this precise moment that Simeon breaks out into a song of praise. Do you all do that when you get excited about something? How many of you all just break out into song? I know some of you all do. 
I think that's fantastic. Here is Simeon. We don't know if he was a musician or not. We don't know if he could carry a tune. Scripture doesn't say that. Scripture says that he broke out into a song of praise. The mood of the song begins as jubilant music of a Jewish wedding, but then it becomes kind of contemplative, and it ends with a note of extreme agony. In the book of Luke, chapter 2, Let's start in verse uh, 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. He came in the Spirit into the temple. His parents brought him to Jesus uh, to do for him according to the custom of the law. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Why? My eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. The mood is set. Simeon's desire, before he would die, was to be able to see the Messiah. What a bucket list. What a thing to look forward to. How do you top that? I'm not sure that you can. So when I'm talking with some of these residents at the nursing home, I had three or four of them just sitting around. There was one gentleman there. He would, uh, somebody would say something, oh yeah, I can beat that. Then somebody else would talk, oh yeah, I can beat that. The next woman that said something said, looked at him and said, I know you can probably beat this, but this is mine. My inward parts jump for joy. How do you beat a bucket list like this? And here, Simeon is seeing this realized. Simeon says several things in this passage of scripture. He says several things about who Jesus is. He says that he's the deliverer. In verse 30 it says this, My eyes have seen your salvation. You see, to see Jesus is to see God's salvation. This is a salvation, thankfully, that is for all people. While we know that Jesus was a Jew and came first to the Jews, it's interesting, Luke here does not limit his coming to just one group of people. He begins with Jesus coming for all people. Verse 31 and the first part of verse 32 says, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. He came to shine the light of God into every nation, every tribe, every tongue. The gospel is very global in scope, isn't it? And the story of redemption from Genesis to the book of Revelation to where we are now tells us that the gospel is for all. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save those who are lost, regardless of where you're from. Regardless of what language you speak. Regardless of what customs you hold. The gospel is for all people. The gospel is also for God's people. In the last part of verse 32, Simeon says that uh, he calls Jesus the glory of Israel. You see, Simeon sees the fulfillment of all the hopes and the fears of all the years that are echoed by the Jewish people waiting for the Messiah to come. Jesus is here. 
I can picture Simeon saying this, ta-da, the wait is over. Can I say this sadly today? There are so many people that are still waiting for the Messiah to come. They have completely missed the point that the Messiah has already come. He has already uh, died on a cross for them. He has already risen from the grave for them. They're still looking. He's already here. And Simeon is saying this, that salvation as the deliverer, it's for all people, it's for God's people. We also know this, that the gospel is a divider, isn't it? There are some that will believe and there are some that will not believe. Okay? Jesus is the divider. Because there will always be some that will not believe. There will be some that will not put their faith and their trust in him. And Simeon, he predicts that there will be some that will resist and will reject not just the message of Jesus Christ, but will reject him outright. Simeon says this. He uses three images and three word pictures. In verse 34, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel. It's, the theologians look at this as, as a type of stone, something that they would trip over, something that they would falter over. In the last part of verse 34, we read this, and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. The second image is that of a sign. You know what? Aren't signs great? Don't you just love signs? Uh, signs can be very important. Okay? Uh, stop signs. Those are there for our benefit, right? Okay? Uh, they are very important. What happens if you don't see a sign? What happens if you don't see a stop sign? Bad things can happen. Okay? Signs are great. But in order for a sign to be effective, what do we need to do? We need to see it. We need to know what we're looking for. We need to be able to see it. Many people rise up against Jesus. Why? Because they don't see him for who he really is and for why he has come. Simeon also draws the alliteration of a sword. A sword. A sword will pierce your soul. It refers to what was going to happen in the entire backdrop of the life of Christ. Can I say this? Uh, Christ was loved by many, wasn't he? Can I say this? He was hated by a whole lot more. Okay. And Simeon uses these word pictures to get that all across. Simeon is saying this, Mary, they are going to touch this child, but they won't be able to do anything about it. They're going to hate him. They're going to lie about him. They will spread rumors about you and Joseph. They will smear his name with malicious lies. And you're going to have to take it. You're going to have to stand there and watch it happen. That's that whole idea that we see here. You know, I don't think you'll catch Simeon greeting us with Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. He pauses, he clears his throat. He tells her that Christmas will never be merry. The New Year will never be happy until people surrender their lives, not to their will, but to the will of God. Here's the truth. 
Since Jesus has entered the world, he has divided the human race. How has he done that? He has divided the human race in this way. There will be some that will accept and there will be some that will reject. Nobody can say, uh, I'm on the fence. Nobody can say, well, I don't care or I've never heard. You're either going to accept Jesus Christ or you're not. The Bible uses very powerful imagery here. Amidst all of the trees and the gifts, the bright lights, the parties. Remember this, uh, uh, while Christmas can be very costly, there is a much greater cost to following Christ. The cost is far greater. Following Jesus is not without piercing pain at times. Christmas is meant to be happy and joyful. But it's also a time of seriousness. It's also a time that we need to pause and remember that for those that, that reject Jesus Christ, a stone, a sign, a sword, it's all in there. It happened exactly as Simeon had predicted. Jesus is born. Mary and Joseph raise him. I can't help but think that as a young boy, Jesus loved to play. We don't see that in scripture, do we? We don't know what he did. Do you think Jesus enjoyed climbing trees? What boy doesn't? Do you think Jesus worked in, in the shop with his dad? It's very possible. Do you think that Mary ever had to say something to Jesus like close the door, what was you raised in a barn? I think they, I don't know. Here's what I know. Jesus was, a, was a born as a baby. He lived, right? Gave, he loved to have fun. I'm convinced of that. You know? I think that Jesus... Uh, was a great teacher. Where was he found at the age of 12? He's found in the temple. Right? And he was the one teaching. Okay? We see that Jesus grew and that he did miracles. We see that Jesus raised the dead. He turned water into wine. He did. He healed the sick. The blind could see. The deaf could hear. All of these things. And ultimately, people still would not believe. And that dividing line is drawn there due to their unbelief. But yet, in spite of it all, Christ came and he died on that cross for us. There are some lessons that we can learn from the music here. I think, number one, we need to be in the right place in order to hear from God. Simeon was exactly uh, where he needed to be. He was waiting anxiously in the temple for him. Doesn't say that he was waiting at home. Doesn't say he was waiting anywhere else other than where he was to be. He was in the right place. Also, Simeon uh, did not give up, did he? It says he waited and he waited for the consolation of Israel. Don't give up. Number three, cultivate being filled and led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is mentioned three times here in verses 25 through 27. Cultivate what it is to be filled with the Spirit of God and to be led by the Spirit. You know, when, when God calls you to do something, okay, this is a problem that I have, okay, and I, I would dare say I'm no different than any of y'all. Uh, don't procrastinate, but rather get right on it and to do what God has called you to do. You know, this can take the form of many things, can't it? Not just being in the right place at the right time, but I've had so many people over the years that have said, well, I think God's calling me to do this or that, 
But then I start looking at it, and I'm going, no, nah, nah, I'm not going to do that because of this or this or this or this. If God calls you to do something, just do it. And we leave the outcome to God. Number four, I think that we, in this day and age, we have lost the wonder of Christmas. We're going to talk about this a little bit next week. That saying, familiarity breeds contempt. We get so blasé about, oh, it's Christmas again. I know where pastor's going to be. I've heard it all before. Here's, here about 10, 12 years ago, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine. He said, yeah, somebody from our congregation came up to me and said they could actually write my message for me because they knew exactly where I was going to be. We've heard it all before. I would say to that person, I would say this, begin to marvel again. Begin to marvel again. Don't think of Christmas as a time of, like the video showed, burning the cookies, setting up a tree, getting all this food together, having a whole house full of people, and then forgetting what Christmas is really all about. That video, to me, was powerful. I just, I watched it over and over again. We need to begin to marvel again. We need to be able to focus on what Christmas really is. Number five, you are not ready to die until you receive the salvation that only Christ can give. I love what Simeon said. He took the baby Jesus in his arms. I'm going to paraphrase for just a moment. My bucket list is done. It says, Lord, I'm ready to go home now. I can die in peace. You're not ready to die until you have received Jesus and trusted him as Lord and Savior. You see, that's what Christmas is all about. We celebrate the birth of Christ because without the birth of Christ, we would not have the death of Christ. And without the death of Christ, we would not have the resurrection of Christ. Can I say without the resurrection of Christ, we have nothing at all? This is where it begins. It's been said that Jesus is not just the reason for the season. He is the reason for living. He's the reason for dying. John 1.12 puts it this way, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become the children of God. You see, the whole point of a bucket list is to maximize every moment that you have so that you live life to your fullest. I would suggest to you the best thing you could ever have on any list would be to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I would suggest to you that that should be number one on every list. And you might be here this morning and you say, boy, I can, I can check that one off. I've already done that. You know what I'm going to say? Praise God for that. I'm going to say, I, I rejoice right with you. Keep going. Keep sharing. Keep doing. Bucket lists can be a great thing. Scott and I, we talk about it every so often. We're trying to get the Michigan pastors to jump out of an airplane. There's three of us. There's four of us. Okay. I, I think so far, how many have we heard from? We've heard from all. We've heard from all, but not all are in total agreement. Okay. I'm not going to say we pray for JR over this, but... Um, Out of the plane? Okay. 
That's something that we've all been looking forward to, and as fun as that sounds, the most important thing isn't jumping out of an airplane. The most important thing isn't landing well, though I certainly hope that we do. You know, the most important thing is that if I jump out of that airplane, and for whatever reason my chute doesn't open, the most important thing is that I know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know what? I'm thankful that I have already done that. I'm not going to wait until I get on that plane and then do it right then. I'm, I'm good now. That is the most important thing. Simeon had something that he looked forward to. He had something that, that uh, he said, once I do this, I'm ready to go, and I can die in peace. We don't know anything else about Simeon. We do know he was a man of great faith. And he had a great salvation song, didn't he? Loving Father, God, we thank you. Father, we thank you for the music of scripture and how it relates to us where we are. Father, we thank you. Lord, for the message that Simeon had. Perseverance. Lord, he waited patiently. He was where he needed to be. He never gave up. Kept watching, kept waiting. Father, at the realization of who Christ was, Father, he was so content and so happy. Father, his mindset was, I can depart in peace. Lord, I pray, Father, for those that don't know Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, that they would come to know that Christ had to come as a baby. He had to come so that he could die on a cross. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you. Father, for the greatest gift of all, forgiveness of sin, eternal life, being in your presence, and Lord, walking with you each and every day. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.